Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. Feeling good today. I feel especially good because uh, I had my heart fixed. Yeah, six days ago I had a heart ablation taking care of a irregularity that I've had in my heart for 10 years and it's amazing. It's amazing to have a regular beating heart. So I don't know, you know, going forward how that's going to affect me, but I can only believe it's going to be positive. So enough about that though. We're here to critique creationism. Another episode of Critiquing Creationism, we're going to take a quick look at a short article, 510 words, 510 word blog post, basically, at Institute for Creation Research. So the question of this little article is, where did all the amazing adaptations of desert adapted organisms come from? Now, this article is by James Johnson. He writes a lot of articles for ICR. He is a, hmm, he's got a law degree and a theology degree, but he almost always writes stuff about biology. Clearly he has a fascination with biology, but I'm going to say his biological knowledge is not great. Um, it's, you know, sort of light Wikipedia style uh, knowledge. And in some cases, I think he hasn't even um, looked at Wikipedia to, to look for some of the potential answers to some of his questions. All right, I'm babbling. Let's dive right in, just start reading what he's got to say, and we're going to react to it. Christ's creativity in canyon critters. Grand Canyon animals display many marvelous traits and behaviors as they live life in this harsh habitat. Yep, Grand Canyon habitat's pretty harsh, hard to live in. Here's James Johnson's ultimate answer as to how they do it. These Grand Canyon creatures succeed thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ's providential provisioning and not due to impersonal luck. There you have it. Jesus Christ provided the ability for them to survive in that habitat, not impersonal luck. Of course, he's referring to evolution when he talks about impersonal luck. That's the contrast. Luck couldn't have made these things, have these amazing adaptions. Only a designer could have done so. Uh, hey, look over here at these article highlights. Let's just, let's just say, so what does he think are the highlights of this? Jesus Christ designed desert animals with specific abilities to thrive in even the most severe environments. And you might be wondering yourself, why is he saying Jesus Christ? You're probably not, maybe some of you aren't used to hearing that particular language. Isn't God the author of creation, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, you understand that uh, scriptures, especially things like, uh, say, Colossians 1.16, for all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, were created in him. And the in him is a reference to Jesus in the New Testament. And Hebrews 1, 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir over all things and through whom he also made the universe or made the world or made all things, depending on the translation there. And so it's understood in Christian theology that the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, is actually the, the creator, right? He's the, 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 the member of the Godhead that's responsible for creation. So I just wanted to, to make that clear that this is not as unusual as it might strike you. Um, this, this is actually well within the bounds of traditional um, uh, Christian Protestant uh, theology. Now, Back to that first statement. Jesus Christ designed desert animals with specific abilities to thrive in even the most severe environments. Now, this is, of course, why I'm bringing this article up, and it's the thing I'm going to talk about when we look at the interesting animals that he's going to reference. Um, how did Jesus make animals adapted to the Grand Canyon when in the six-day creation narrative, the Grand Canyon certainly didn't exist, and those harsh environments that the Grand Canyon experiences today didn't exist in the original cre perfect creation right in this original perfect creation most creationists don't see like massive ice caps and uh, extreme deserts and you know extreme environments they see a place where all organisms are you know plants are covering the entire earth all right vegetation abounds and animals don't have those kinds of needs so that is the question. That is the thing that we need to, or James Johnson needs to address, is how did Jesus Christ design these animals for a world that didn't exist in the original creation, right? Jesus Christ designed, created the original world in six days, and this was this 
perfect creation. What did these animals, how did these animals come to have the characteristics they have today? How did they change from the past to the present? Uh, what are the other two summary points here? Vultures' digestive systems are built to handle dead flesh. Horny toads can squirt blood out of their eyes as a defensive measure. And roadrunners know exactly where to strike to kill venomous rattlesnakes. Yes, three adapted skills, all right? Adaptive features of these organisms that allow them to survive in these extreme environments. You notice what all of these have in common? All of these characters texts have in common is some either avoidance of being killed or the ability to kill or eat dead flesh. In other words, things that are dead. In other words, there's death in this world. These All these characteristics are exquisitely designed for death. Right? Exquisitely designed around death existing in the world. But Jesus Christ created a world according to young earth creationist theology, with no death in it. Mm, caveat. Of course, there's some types of biological death, but no death to mammals, right? Or vertebrates, or land vertebrates at least. And that would include all these organisms listed here. So if the original plan is no death, and there was no extreme environments, uh, these characteristics were not necessary, how is he going to respond to this? How does, how does he explain this? 500 words, let's get through it. Turkey vultures. It's not by good luck that turkey vultures can find rotten carrion, gobble it down, and not die of food poisoning. Right? It's not by good luck that they can find rotten carrion. Yes, they have amazing eyes, right? Amazing skills for finding the food they need in order to survive. And that food is dead flesh. Right? They can gobble it down, right? They are, have adaptations in their beaks. And then once it's in their stomach, they have the ability to digest that rotten material, which was obviously full of all kinds of other critters, including a lot of bacteria, which are decomposers. And so potentially it could be harmful to them, right? I, you know, if I ate what they ate, I would not feel very well. And yet vultures seem to be perfectly happy eating dead flesh that's rotting. So these are all amazing characteristics. Now, uh, I noticed the, the last wording there, right? It's not by good luck. It's not by luck that this happened. This is by some kind of design providence. Equipped by God for scavenging in this fallen world, they serve as garbage collectors, processors, picking apart and eating roadkill and other carpus, carcasses. In other words, they're, they're designed as garbage collectors and processors. That was their design to get rid of stuff that has died in an efficient manner, which allows for the recycling of that material. Or why don't they get sick and die of botulism? The acidity of vultures' digestive tracts is astounding. The digestive juices of stomachs can reach pH between 1.5 and 1, more corrosive than carb battery acid. Actually, our stomachs aren't that much less acidic. <laughs> you know, we have extremely acidic uh, stomachs as well. It's that's why when you vomit, it doesn't taste so good in your mouth. You're literally dissolving the inner lining of the cell, the tissues uh, in your mouth and, and actually damaging your teeth if you were to not you know, rinse your mouth out afterwards. Sorry. Yeah, that was probably didn't need to know that. And why this corrosion? Right. Part of this corrosion is to break down the material that you're consuming. I mean, including small bones, right? Uh, and that's what you're doing as well. I mean, you're breaking down, you know, the, with the acid, you're breaking down the, the material that you take into yourself, right, as you eat. And then you're breaking down smaller molecules that you can then absorb, right? Well, they are also breaking down, you know, germ-destroying bacteria and other things. And you are also doing that. There's not a whole lot of bacteria that can survive your stomach. And so vultures themselves would become dead meat. Okay, so there's... You know, uh, little lesson number one, vultures. Amazing, amazing design. How, how could they possibly do that? And how could luck, how could chance events, in other words, how could natural selection, how could mutations and natural selection and, and other mechanisms of evolution possibly make something so incredibly des well designed for this particular environment and these particular um responsibilities in the world all right horned lizards 
And these lizards, camouflage fails to defend them against predators. Wait a second. If camouflage fails to defend them against predators, I guess they don't have good enough camouflage. Why didn't uh, Jesus give them a camouflage that's so good that they don't have to have any defensive mechanism? <laughs> that's the thing. It's like, <laughs> you can always say that I mean, the reason one organism has to do one thing is because it's failed to do another thing. Right? I mean, there's no such thing as a, a perfect organism that does everything perfectly well. Right? Every organism can't perfect every single trait. Um, there's trade-offs, and this is the trade-off. If you're not good enough at, uh, you might be fairly camouflaged, but if you're not camouflaged well enough, then you better have another defensive mechanism. And so what horned lizards do is they have the ability to squirt blood up to five feet from their eyes to repel approaching predators. This is a bizarre sounding defense, right? It's called ocular sinus blood squirting. And it's not something lizards luckily evolved as needed by some trial and error as hungry predators lunged at them in the canyon. So he seems to see that he seems to think that um, horned lizards are like walking around and they don't have this ability at all. Um, and but they're not camouflaged well enough. They're being seen by a predator and then um, a predator and then somehow maybe a predator lunges at them and they by accident, by dumb luck, they squirt some blood out of their eye. All right. They don't know why they just did it and um they survived and because they survived maybe they had offspring and they gave that trait to their offspring and as a result their offspring also had this ability to do that which gives them a slightly better chance of surviving an encounter with a predator wait a second i'm, I'm actually starting to describe natural selection right <laughs> that there's variation in a population uh that it has that it, they might have this uh, capacity somehow through some variant that they have but um, I don't know the exact origins of this particular skill, uh, but I do know that there are multiple different species of horned toads, and many of them have this cap capability, and they don't all do it exactly the same way or to the same effect. And I know there's some species that don't do it. And I also know that there's other species of lizards that actually exude blood uh, from their eyes. They don't necessarily squirt it. In other words, there's a whole bunch of different variants on this particular theme. So it's very possible that there is a mechanism for ex ex exuding, all right, uh, fluids from the edges of the eyes. Um, much like there are lizards that uh, get rid of salt right, in this way when they live in an excessive salt environment. And so if you have developed and adapted um, that type of characteristic, and then you simply add high blood pressure, you know, and the ability to create high blood pressure very quickly, which basically all, you know, vertebrate land vertebrates have the ability to uh, regulate their um, blood pressure system. You and I have the ability to change our blood pressure quite quickly in some circumstances, in some places in our body. Um, and so if you just specialize that skill in a particular gland, then you're going to be able to to do something like squirt blood out, you know, more than just making a droplet, but squirting it out. But let's move on. Roadrunners. Likewise, roadrunners didn't luckily learn to hit or miss guessing how to speedily bite a rattlesnake next to its venom's fangs to prevent a striking rattler from successfully, successfully biting them. Is Jane Johnson really not able to imagine how potentially a roadrunner might learn how to attack and kill a rattlesnake. After all, this isn't just a defensive mechanism. Roadrunners actually eat rattlesnakes. And so there is, once the roadrunner has the ability to once in a while kill a rattlesnake, right? There is every incentive to reinforce that skill, right? More successful you are because if you kill a rattlesnake and you have food and energy, then you have more energy than maybe other, your other neighboring um, uh, roadrunners. Therefore, you have more offspring. Those offspring may have, have the, that um, characteristic of being a little bit more successful at killing rattlesnakes, in which case they're more successful more often. They have more food, so therefore any mutations they have that give them even better abilities will get passed down to the next generation. In other words, incrementally, they get better and better and better at killing uh, rattlesnakes. As long as the rattlesnakes don't kill them all initially and they survive, there's the capacity for them to adapt 
to that particular organism living in its environment and actually take advantage of that particular organism in its environment, not simply adapt in terms of learning how to survive in that environment, but actually thrive in that particular environment. And that's not luck, right? The mutations that may occur in individuals may be random, but the natural selective process is not a lucky process by any means. But the natural, pro the natural selective process is not luck, right? That's selection of survivors in that particular environment that may or most likely have characteristics that gave them advantages over other individuals in that same environment. Okay, we're almost done. We got to get to the main point. Rabbits, wasps, squirrels, and rats, as noted in previous Acts and Facts articles, that's that's where this was originally published. It's, it's like basically a newsletter. He's writing an article for a newsletter that goes out to tens of thousands of people. Other canyon critters exhibit Christ's creative and caring providences, such as black-tailed black jackrabbits whose ears radiate excessive body heat, right? Got to get rid of this extra heat. So you see you know, desert rabbits have these huge ears, also better for hearing as well. Tarantula hawk wasps, where they inject their young into the flesh of tarantula spiders. Mm. Tassel-eared squirrels, kangaroo rats who don't need to drink water due to their water-conserving physiology. Yes, they have amazing um, kidneys that allow them to recruit most of their water. And so the food that they eat when they break it down, when you break down food, you actually make water. So if you can preserve enough water, you don't actually have to drink any water. And some organisms are able to do that, like these kangaroo rats. Again, not a skill that you would imagine would be necessary in the original creation at all. So how did they change their kidneys to become kidneys that didn't allow it for any water escape, especially since the original creation? Again, they wouldn't need to have done this. They wouldn't need that particular skill set. Okay, so how do they do it? How do they get from point A, creation, to point B, this world we live in now, in which they are displaying adaptations that were completely unnecessary in the original creation. Grand Canyon's diverse denizens continuously track environmental conditions and then self-adjust their traits and behaviors for purposeful results. That is a one-line summary of Institute for Creation Research's understanding of how organisms adapt and change in the world. It's their model called continuous environmental tracking, which is juxtaposed against natural selection and other mechanisms of evolutionary biology, which most other young earth creationists accept are functioning, working mechanisms in this world that sculpt organisms in the present day. Their mechanism is continuously, continuous environmental tracking. And let me read the sentence again because it describes in essence what they think is happening. Those roadrunners, those vultures, those other organisms, they didn't live in these original environments. Then after the flood, when they departed from the ark, horny lizards and others came to this desert environment. They suddenly were faced and confronted with something that was completely different than their original environment. Right? They have, it's very dry. It's very, very hot. The organisms around them are very different and organisms are dying, right? And they're able to die and they're able to kill other organisms. And so suddenly they had to just morph themselves into having characteristics that both defended themselves and also helped them to attack other organisms. And how did they do that? They continuously tracked the environment. They looked around and they saw this is a desert environment. Oh, it's really hot outside there's something I could eat that I've never eaten before. What would I need to eat that thing, all right, that carry on? Well, I would need super strong stomach acid. And, you know, I would need to lose the feathers on my head because that could be damaging for me to have this stuff hanging around on my face all the time that I've been putting my head into, right? I would need a certain type of beak. So, I'm looking at the environment, I see, oh, wait a second, I don't have those characteristics right now, but I need them, all right? And so I'm looking at the environment, I have sensors that tell me, like, this is a different environment, I need to turn on those characteristics. 
right? What, what do you think self-adjust their traits means right here? See that? Then they self-adjust their traits and behaviors, right? Before I behaved like, hey, I, I, don't, I don't want to eat that uh, dead stuff over there. I'm, I was fine eating plants. But wait a second, there aren't enough plants around here. I mean, actually, there are plants around here, but I don't want to eat those plants. I, I'm going to look at that carry and I'm like, I'm going to change my behavior. Instead of eating a plant, I'm just going to eat this dead meat. And oh, and then when I taste that meat, I could tell that it probably had a bunch of lethal bacteria in it for me. And, um, and so I better also change my internal physiology as well. I better self-adjust that. So the organism is self-adjusting. And how does it self-adjust? Because Jesus created that organism with the ability to self-adjust. You know, like, well, where does the self-adjustment come from? Well, they apparently have some kind of like genetic switches. They have a set of genes. They have a bunch of, well, yeah, we'll just say a bunch of genes that maybe they weren't using in the original creation because they didn't need them. But the creator placed in vultures a set of genes for being able to eat carrion, right? But the genes you can turn on in your stomach and all the other things you would need to do, a whole suite of things to change the nature of a vulture into what it is today. And it's, but it's the vulture who looked at the environment and said, wow, I need to turn these genes on now. And presumably other organisms that aren't vultures didn't have that particular set of genes, so they didn't, couldn't self-adjust in that way. Each organism is designed with a certain ability to self-adjust to certain end goals or end traits. And as they go out into the world and they encounter different environments, if they happen to be in an environment where that they have the self-adjusting trait inside of them, then they can turn it on and they can suddenly change themselves and live in that particular environment. So I think there is, you know, but the weird, the weird thing about this is there is a form of selection going on because, um, you know, what if after the ark you had animals go out like roadrunners and a roadrunner ends up in the tropics and some individuals end up in this desert um, and they all have the same design, like pre-adapted traits, right? the internal extra genetic information they have that they weren't originally using. And in the desert, they like look around, they're like, I'm in a desert, I need these straight. And they, they were able to self-adjust. In the tropics, they're like, I'm looking around, I, uh, I can't turn those genes. I don't have genes to self-adjust to living in the tropics. And that's why there aren't any roadrunners living in the tropics, right? Because they couldn't self-adjust and so they died. So I think what young earth creationists, well, Institute for Creation Research is saying like organisms went out and they started to you know reproduce right and as they migrated um, they may have like known where they needed to migrate to like I know I have genes for eating carrion uh, in a desert environment for that of those particular types of organisms and so therefore I'm going to migrate to a desert environment so. I can continuously track the environment. So as I'm moving away from the ark, oh, I'm in the, I'm in, I'm in a wet environment. I got to get out of this because my genes aren't made for this. So I'm going to move to the desert environment. And hey, okay, now that I'm here, I can turn on these genes and I can adapt to this particular environment. And so maybe it's that scripted, or maybe it's like, okay, I've got all these genes, and then they spread out in the world, and then they're selected, right? If you ended up in an environment, you know. I have genes for being desert adapted, but I ended up in a cold environment. I didn't survive there. So you were selected out for that. And all the organisms that went to a cold environment and had the genes for adapting to the cold environment, they then turned those on and they became adapted to that particular environment. Oh, this is kind of fatiguing uh, talking about this because it's, it's just hard to, to, to visualize. It's such a just, it's just a concept. It's just an idea. There's no, evidence for this um, continuous environmental tracking. Um, so canyon critters, let's get to the next sentence. Spent a lot of time on that one. Canyon critters survive because of precisely targeted solutions to habitat challenges. Hmm, I should have read that first, right? Canyon critters survive because of precisely targeted solutions to habitat changes. So 
there are precise targeted solutions for particular habitat challenges. So I guess that vulture was created with a precise solution for that particular problem, even though that problem might not have occurred until after the flood. So they were created 2,000 years. They survived in a non-desert environment or maybe on not even eating carrion. And then they get off the ark and then they move to this environment and then they become, they have a targeted solution for that particular environment. So truly, the Grand Canyon houses a community of amazing animals. Absolutely. Those animals display Christ's bioengineering genius in design details and demonstrate the creator's providential provision for wildlife living in the Grand Canyon. So they were created without these characteristics, at least expressed in the original creation, but they were bioengineered in such an amazing way that they wouldn't even use those characteristics potentially for thousands of years until the right moment happened. And that organism there tracking the environment had a sensor that said, it's time. My time has come. I can finally use these characteristics for which I was originally engineered for. Well, this raises a lot of questions. You know, first and foremost, my mind, I immediately, I immediately wonder, what about genetic entropy? Don't young earth creationists talk about genetic entropy all the time, about how every time organisms replicate, they introduce errors into their DNA? Don't they believe that organisms are error-filled, that they have thousands and thousands of errors that are corrupting genes and breaking genes? And remember, it's natural selection that actually preserves genes over time, because if you have a population of 100 individuals and two of them have a broken gene due to mutation, and they die, the other ones survive and keep reproducing. So therefore that keeps the genes that are good in the population. But now let's think about this bioengineered solution for a problem 2000 years from now. Let's say, let's say there's an organism living right now that has a solution to an environment or a new organism that it's going to encounter 2000 years from now. Right, 2,000 years from now, there's, a, there's an animal living right now, and it's descendant. 2,000 years from now is going to meet another animal, and it's going to be like, this is, a, this is a challenge I've not experienced before. I need to adapt to this. Fortunately, I was given a, what's, what's the word? A precisely targeted solution to this problem. 6,000, well, actually, at this point, 8,000 years ago. I was given the solution 8,000 years ago. I'm ready to use it now. If that solution is found in its DNA, right? Some set of programs, and some of them have never been used before. How do they how do they preserve those programs for eight thousand years? How does how does Jesus design the preservation of that program when the programs are all decaying? I I don't get that. I, I've never seen, I don't, I have never seen a young earth creationist address that question at all. Uh, all right. Like I said before, this article is one of hundreds at the Institute for Creation Research that have this exact same theme. Here's an amazing cap capacity of an organism. And, and usually it's, look how amazing this is. Look how amazing this organism's ability is to survive or kill, or be a parasite, or, you know, do all these things that none of them supposedly were able to, or, or had the ability to, or well, let's just say used in the original creation. But they were specifically designed for today. And we have to believe that that design today is the, is, is when we look at that, we should be able to see that that couldn't have happened through evolutionary processes. Well, because they're defined as luck, right? This can't happen by luck, by chance. Now, I don't know if I need to say it, but no evolutionary biologist believes that this is dumb luck, right? This is not just chance. Far from it, right? It's a mechanism. It's a process. It's something that we can observe happening and observe organisms adapting and changing in their environments in ways that are not 
sheer luck. Uh, hmm, I think that's enough. That's that's good. Critique and creation. That's my critique for today. Another look at and I'm I'm the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm I'm just like trying to grapple with this continuous environmental tracking thing and try to understand what do they mean by it. I mean I've watched Guliusa, who's the president of ICR, like explain continuous environmental tracking, and even after he explains it, I'm just like I'm mystified, like. It, it's I think mostly because it's hand wavy stuff. It's like you know, and and this happens, and they're there. And he talks like an engineer, but you would think with an engineer, you get down to like the, the the specifics of like, well, how does that happen? How did you go from point A to point B? How did you go from the original organism to the organism you have today? Because all young Earth creationists agree that the original created organisms don't look like they do today. In other words, change has happened. Organisms have changed. They have adapted. And so everybody grapple, everyone, creationist and non-creationist alike, grapple with the question of how organisms adapt and change in this world. And can you use environmental tracking just makes no sense to me. It doesn't make a sense to a whole bunch of other younger creationists either. Um, but this uh, concept of well, this is such an amazing adaptation that only God could have done it. And but but it's not just that God could have done it. God must have done it in a miraculous, instantaneous fashion. But he couldn't have done it today. He didn't just like adapt them today. He must have adapted them to the original creation because the creation's done after the end of six days. So everything that this organism needed is in that package in the original creation. And somehow it has to go from this organism and change into something else, but not through any miraculous means. That's the whole like, well, that's the miracle of the bioengineering. Somehow it was bioengineered to some amazing extent such that it would know all the possible outcomes and would be ready with program solutions for future problems that didn't exist in the original creation. You know, in some ways that's a little deistic, right? It's like saying God created everything like, okay, here's it, here it is. I get it all wrapped up. I put every set of instructions in here and now it's just like, you got to play it out, but I'm not really, in, I'm not really overseeing this process anymore because I've already pre-programmed, right? I've already designed the program that's going to run at a certain point on a certain day and time in the future. And I'm just going to poof, there it goes. But what is What's the mechanisms along the way that are the trip points? In other words, what does it mean that uh, you know, I said I was done? Uh, I, 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 I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. Um, denizens continuously track environmental conditions. I mean, I know they would say, like, well, they're seeing, they're touching, they're, 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 they have sensors, right? Organisms have sensors. And so they're, oh, yeah, it's getting hotter, right? And if it's getting hotter, then I need to self adjust. So I can, t I'll turn on different things in me, and that's my self-adjustment. I can turn on a whole new program that makes me into a carnivore when I wasn't a carnivore before. Like, what's the trip point that, that turns on these programs? And can we find these hidden programs? Are these genes that weren't being used but now being used? Can we look at organisms today and find like new genes that aren't being used that have a future purpose? Like if you were to take, if you were to, uh, well, hey, uh, we have organisms that are, we, we have genomes that are 4,000 years old, much older genomes. But in the young earth creationist uh, worldview, we have genomes from 4,000 years ago, completely sequenced, right? So they're only 2,000 years after creation. Can I look in that horse that's been sequenced from more than 4,000 years ago, compare it to today's horses? Shouldn't I be able to see like programs in that particular horse that that weren't maybe being used then, but now I can see those programs are being used. Like here's some genes, and then uh, now these genes potentially are used in the new environment. I uh, yeah, I mean I think there's some interesting predictions that young Earth creationists could make about genomes and about this type of stuff. Um in order to test their own hypothesis. 
but I'm not sure that they really want to test this hypothesis too rigorously. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, all right. Hey, thanks for hanging here. You know, smash that like button, um, follow me, and um, we got a, hopefully a lot of stuff coming up now that um, my heart's fixed and I'm feeling better. Uh, so take care. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.